Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Great to have you in midweek editions here at Tale of Our City Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Some more on conference realignment. Uh, what talks are going on? What do you believe as things either fall apart or shake out with the ACC, the Big 12, and uh, the Pac 12? Mike Babcox going to check in with us here in about 20 minutes. We'll stream Babbers, get his thoughts on the world of college football and tackle some Husker football questions and topics. Mike Shuhart, uh, I'm sure Shuey will be doing the interview uh, on that bridge over the Lazy River as the pool is open at Wilderness Ridge. So Shuey coming up in about 30 minutes or so. And then to piece all of this together, one of our favorites, uh, the riverboat gambler from Mississippi. And uh, he was outstanding for Bob Devaney as a quarterback and an assistant before he took over the reins at Washington State and Iowa State. The gentleman, Jim Walton, the coach, going to be with us in the 5 o'clock hour. Numbers to get in can join us today on Hale Varsity Radio, 466 825 Five eight six five. Some comments from Aaron Rodgers on Samari Toure with Pat McAfee. We'll have that for you as uh, Toure turning heads. And Baker Mayfield gets out of jail in Cleveland and is now in Carolina. How is that going to shake out? We'll tackle some NFL. Find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt, that's me. And at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. You can email the show, Chris at HaleVarsity.com. So it's interesting here with college football's realignment, the next steps, the ACC, the Big 12, and the Pac-12, scramble and chaos, what is likely to happen next. Good couple of stories. Pete Thamel from ESPN, and you've got a conglomeration of folks from The Athletic that uh, have reports out uh, earlier this morning. So what what do you think is most likely? What do you believe? And why should you care? Well, you should care because uh, it really depends on if and when the the Big Ten is done adding, first and foremost, because that will affect Nebraska. You'd have to believe that if there is further, and I don't know that there will be, aside of uh, aside from Notre Dame, if if that does happen, that's that's the one you want to add. And maybe you just make Notre Dame feel so special that that's it. They don't need a Stanford or anyone else to come along with them. You've got math being done uh, by the Big Ten. And that is bang for buck. You're getting uh, a lot of TV sets and a lot of value, brand value and advertising revenue value with USC, UCLA. That's why you add them. And you are coast to coast now. You just aren't going to ask Rutgers to fly west, and you're not going to ask SC or UCLA to fly east that often. I would hope not. Uh, You could have another conference. Maybe the ACC just changes their name uh, to another coast to coast league, ACCL. Kidding, kind of. But that's what I'm interested in here is do you believe that the ACC – and the Pac-12 could get in cahoots. You have the big two. Is there room for a big three? And SEC and Big Ten are dominant because what they've done on the field, and uh, they've been proactive, and they've added the best brands in football to already good leagues that get to the playoffs, and you have an Ohio State, and you have a Michigan, you have an Alabama, you have a Florida, a Tennessee, and LSU. I mean, you have some who's who of college football, and and you're pretty good in the basketball world with Kentucky, that brand. The Big Ten, good in the basketball world uh, for sure uh, with the addition of a a UCLA, but you've had the Michigan and Michigan states of the world 
uh, that are that are really really solid basketball brands along with Ohio State. Let me go down the list: Purdue, Indiana, for sure. Indiana, a blue blood uh, in name for the the hardwood. But what's likely to shake out here, Elijah? Do you have the Big Twelve as is reported by the Athletic in serious talks with six Pac twelve schools? Is is the Big Twelve going to pick up a six pack? Is that what their uh, their plan is? Is that going to be Arizona and Arizona State and Colorado and Oregon and Utah and Washington? That'd be great. The thing that is a, a hitch for me with the ACC going and rating, adding two versus falling apart, and the ACC is a bit protected because their grant of rights deal is so long with ESPN. It's to twenty thirty six. So you want to get out of the league? Guess what? You're 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 breaking your contract. It's going to get the university lawyers going, and you're going to have to pay through the nose to get out. Everyone but Notre Dame in football. So the SEC can say, "Hey, Florida State, what do you think?" They can say, "Hey, Clemson, what do you think?" Uh, they can knock on that door and sure kick some tires, but it's going to. It's going to cost to get out. So maybe that doesn't make the most sense. Uh, The Big 12 has added, right? They they have Cincinnati. They have Central Florida. They have Houston. They have BYU. Does the Big 12 go absorb the Pac-12? There's no exit fee. There's no penalty if you leave the Pac-12 after 2023. So I don't see the Pac-12, when we get Jim Walden's take on this, being able to, to retain who they want. And and maybe they go shopping for some smaller names. But I just to me it'd be it'd make more sense for the Pac twelve and the Big Twelve to merge geographically than the Pac twelve and the ACC. But maybe the Pac twelve and those six we're talking about with the Big Twelve, hope I'm not confusing, forgive me. Maybe they go they go that route. Um I think it's it's just too early to tell. The thing about the ACC as well, Clemson is not feeding the poor. Okay, Clemson is not subsidizing somebody who's uh, never brought anything to the party in the world of revenue, in the world of attendance, in the world of eyeballs for TV sets. So Clemson makes more. In the ACC, it's not equal distribution. What screwed UCLA and USC is they were making the same amount of money as Oregon State football, despite brand-wise carrying the league. That isn't right. That isn't fair in, in some instances. And Clemson right now is is making more money, and they should. They've won two national championships in the last five years. Uh, Pitt is is a pretty big metropolitan area. North Carolina is a monster brand that is uh, decent in football, but great historically and recently in basketball. There's Duke, that brand, uh, from a basketball standpoint. So th- those are the folks that are that are they they they, they have the nice car and the nice home. Uh, that's not the the same for for everybody in the ACC. So. Maybe the ACC gets proactive. They're teamed up with ESPN, and maybe the network executives at ESPN say, we've got a long-term deal with the ACC. They're a big basketball league. There's still money in basketball for the NCAA tournament. Maybe we we go that route, and the ACC absorbs or teams up with the Pac-12. We wrestle some Pac-12, what's left, away from from Fox, and we have not just uh, the SEC, but we already have invested in the ACC. Let's go add to that investment already. So the heart of your argument here is of any conference, if it's most likely to dissolve, it's the Pac-12. That's abs- Don't you feel? I mean, that's, that's just pretty common when your two big dogs leave. Well, yeah, but I, I still look at what the Big 12 has left after Texas and Oklahoma leave. And they, they've been the, the proactive ones here, but... Could you see some sort of uh, of scenario where those two conferences team up? I mean, 
and not necessarily one of them dissolves, but they kind of become just a, a, a greater one. And that's almost similar to what I could see the SEC and the ACC doing, mm-hmm. where there's some sort of a, agreement in place there. You, you may be still your own separate com- conferences, but yeah, you, you have some sort of rights deal agreement where you're together in some TV rights. I'm not sure how it's all going to work. I'm not the, the expert on this mm-hmm. by any means, but I don't know. Something about it. The Big it, 12 will survive because what's remaining post Texas and Oklahoma aren't really that coveted. Mm-hmm. So they're they're going to be around because no one's coming after them. I mean, but what's coveted in the Pac-12 besides Oregon and Washington? I don't think, I mean, Arizona, Arizona State, the, I mean, the he, Phoenix market, uh, the San Francisco market, those are, those are the two. Mm-hmm. I mean, those, right? I mean, that that's, you add for, for TV eyeballs. And, but I mean, whenever I look at Oregon and Washington are the two that, yeah, they have a draw, but we've heard in recent days that the Big Ten's not even interested in adding Oregon and Washington at this present moment. They're solely focused on Notre Dame. So mm-hmm. uh, I couldn't tell you what's going to happen to the Pac-12, but I, I'm hesitant to think that we're going to have a day three years down the road where the Pac-12 ceases to exist. Well, you'll have a, you'll have a new look. It, it could and, cease and, to it, exist as we know it, but I don't think it's going to be wiped from the college football map completely. No, they'll, they'll go get San Diego State and Boise and whoever else and... Yay, you know, Fresno, and I mean it's you, you got some of the the, the G fives that'll move up, but you're no longer going to be a Power Five league because you've lost your LA flag. So you, you have, quite honestly, Oregon and Washington trump anything the Big Twelve can offer mm-hmm. as as it currently stands. And maybe if you're the ACC, you just go shopping. You take Oregon, you take Washington, you take Utah. You take Stanford, and then who would you take from from the Big 12? Oklahoma State, Baylor, Cincy, Houston, BYU, Central Florida, Kansas. You probably had Kansas. For for basketball. For basketball. TCU, Dallas Market. I'd go get Houston. I'd go get TCU. Uh, I'd go get... uh, I mean, with, with what Kansas, Baylor, with what Baylor's done in basketball in recent years, Baylor might be a smart ad too. Sure, and and yeah, you have um, Oklahoma State that's been really good on the field. I mean, no one wants to go to Stillwater, let alone uh, <laughs> it's not a it's not a massive area to get, but it's a good football program, really good football program under the mullet. So that's interesting, something to think about. Let's turn to Aaron Rodgers and uh, Husker. Uh, draft pick Samare Toure as uh, Toure got a little bit of a sh- shout out, sort of kind of from Rogers today on Pat McAfee. Yeah, what this was was Rogers was kind of talking about wh- what his approach to minicamp is, what he's telling some of the younger guys. Yeah, deep breaths. It's important for everybody involved. Deep, deep breaths. There's a lot of people in football, not just, can't just be our team, that love to crown or obliterate players without pads on this guy is going to be the greatest thing ever in shorts and helmet this guy sucks can't play at all he's terrible and won't make the team every year there's opinions that start coming out about players in, in helmets and and shorts and i would just say let's just everybody take a nice deep long breath and trust the training camp time that we have trust the coaching staff trust the relationships that will be formed and continue to be formed trust the guys in the room like alan lazard and randall cobb and sammy watkins to help these young guys out um physically though they definitely looked apart the they definitely looked apart all three of them all three of the guys we drafted all uh you know have, have physical gifts obviously the top two picks are all uh, bigger um dobbs and watson but uh but the seventh round pick got a lot of stuff to him, um, so I, I, I think it's going to be great. Might not they, know there's his name no yet. better teacher for them on what NFL ball is going to be like than going against our three corners, our top three corners, Jair, Eric Stokes, and obviously Rasul. Um, so those guys have got a real quick initiation to the NFL. And I was joking with uh, uh, with a couple of my buddies um, on the squad and and uh, and in the personnel department and, and training room, and I said, could be a long training camp for the offense. Uh, I like the way our defense is, is looking and playing, and and just on paper, it, it looks like they're going to be pretty formidable. So it could be could be some growing pains for the offense, which would be great for us. It would be nice to, uh, to t- take our lumps uh, from time to time. I think it will help us, uh, you know, get better and, and 
and you know facing a, a really good defense like that. The seventh round guy, it was how Samare was referred to. Uh, there's been a lot of film uh, on Toure and Aaron working out. That's been part of some of the Packers' emphasis. So good for Samare. And this is what we heard from uh, Siragusa just uh, a couple of weeks ago, where he said, I'm not going to bother to learn your name until you make the team. Yeah, <laughs> the late great uh, Goose right there. NFL news, you have Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield battling for the uh, Carolina spot. And uh, Mayfield's got to prove he's better than Darnold. You had the trade go down a fifth round and uh, salaries being split. As uh, Brad Pitt explained in Moneyball, this is what Cleveland thinks of you. They wanted to get, you know, not only did the Yankees, David Justice, uh, uh, want you out, uh, they're paying for you to get out <laughs> half of your $7 million. Uh, in that In that instance, you have Mayfield being uh, funded by Cleveland, a fifth-round pick, and uh, the Panthers paying 485 of the salary while the Browns paying 10.5 and he's got to pass a physical and you have Mayfield can earn back that money based on his performance. So it had to happen. And now you have a number three overall and a number one overall and a third rounder and Matt Corral that's uh, been drafted by the Panthers. We'll see how that shakes out. Mike Badcock's on the way with Hale Varsity. Calling all Storm Chasers fans. A team you never get to see is making their way to Werner Park June 7th through the 12th, and that's the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. It's the first meeting between the two franchises, and there's plenty going on that week. June 9th is the Chasers Community Celebration for Pride Night, presented by PayPal. June 10th is What If Night, where the Storm Chasers will change their name to the Hogs. A little backstory, that was a previous Omaha team and was a potential name change when the franchise was looking to rebrand. It's a battle of pigs versus hogs. You can't have a name change without new jerseys too. Specialty jerseys will be worn that night and of course they'll be autographed and auctioned off. Snag your favorite player June 10th and then run it back on the 11th. It's Salute to Corn Night presented by the Nebraska Corn Board. It's a celebration of all things corn. Corn on the jerseys. Corn in the stands. Trust me, this game will be amazing. See you there. And we're we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Teddy back, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We welcome in historian, author, Hall of Famer, Mr. Husker Football, Mike Babcock, with us at MD Babs on Twitter. We're streaming on ESPN Lincoln's Facebook and also ESPN Lincoln's Twitter handle. Babs, how we doing? Well, I'm doing fine. I'm trying to learn uh, Torrey's new name. and That uh, seventh round guy. Yeah, yeah. I keep thinking it's Amari Torrey, but I guess he's changed his name since he joined the Packers. Uh, maybe a name's been given to him. <laughs> That's part of being the... <laughs> when Aaron Rodgers speaks, everybody responds. What's your take on the Aaron Rodgers new tattoo? I didn't see that. What, what what is this tattoo? Oh wow! Uh, it, it looks like a navigation navigational it, t- type setup, and it's, it's got a astrology two, based, I think. But it look, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, but you got two lions, east and west, and then uh, it's shaded. And it's on the inside of his left forearm. Fair is that his, his left, not his right? Yeah. And he has to explain it so. Here, I, it, there's that. He's he's showing you. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I like it because I have to say that because he's from, like my parents lived in Chico, California. Okay. Um, I went to Chico State College for a couple of years. He went to Butte College. He's from the the area. He went to Butte College, mm-hmm. which is in Chico. And a lot of times when he when he talks, you know, they introduce guys or whatever, and he says Butte College instead of University of California. So I got to go with whatever he says is great. The tattoo is great, even though I have no idea what it's supposed to be. See, I'm a little dubious because of the uh, the the astrology aspect of things. I'm not a, I'm not an astrology believer by any means, and I wouldn't have known it was astrology except I saw a tweet on Twitter. 
of course, where else do you see a tweet? But it said uh, <laughs> the Packers losing in the playoffs every uh, season because Mercury goes into rec- retrograde makes total sense now. And I recognize those works as being astrology words. Maybe somebody who knows astrology more than me knows what it means. But we will put out the APB. <laughs> I thought it was some sort of compass deal going on. Mike, uh, you have Bill Conley of ESPN has put out his West preview for the Big Ten. We'll talk with Phil Steele tomorrow. And uh, in the headline here, Wisconsin, Purdue, Iowa, Minnesota all have a shot. Nebraska not part of that right now, although the percentages look good for Nebraska to make a bowl for uh, for, for Bill Conley. Uh, the name of the game in the West, and, and you can agree with this, and I think you've probably coined it, but it is run game and it is taking care of the football. Iowa on their way to the Big Ten title game. Plus 19 turnover margin in their 10 wins. Minus 7 in their 4 losses. Wisconsin in their 9 wins. Plus 10. Wisconsin's 4 losses. They were minus 9. Purdue. Yes, a 9-win football team in West Lafayette. Plus 7 in turnovers. Their 4 losses. Minus 9. And then the uh, Gophers. Plus 6 in their 9 wins. Minus 3 in their 4 losses. So you had Iowa kind of jump out early and hang on late. There's still lots of love for Nebraska's 3-9 and nine for Conley, where he still can't wrap his arms around what they did statistically and what their record ended with. He asked this question to start his burning question part of the column. What now, Scott Frost? And I, I ask you this, quarterback play in the West has been average. Okay, you can be average and and win the West and get to to Indy. There's some other facet of your football team that has to be really really good, abnormally good, but it can be done. And even Northwestern, uh, despite losing by a couple of scores to Ohio State a couple of years back in the COVID year, they kept that thing uncomfortably close in Indy. So, what what is is necessary for a Thompson or a Purdy or a Smothers when we talk about stats, because that's part of this equation for Bill Conley. Are you wanting 250 yards with a 65% completion percentage? Do you need a 300-yard day from whoever ends up winning the job at quarterback from Nebraska in this Whipple offense, Mike? Well, first of all, do you think there's a doubt about who's going to end up being the quarterback? When I know, I know who's going to probably get named, but from an injury history standpoint, that's that. You know what I mean? That's I mean, both guys. I mean, Purdy and and Casey Thompson both have injury history. The guy that's been pretty rock solid throughout his career at Nebraska when called upon, though, has been Smothers. He's not been injured. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you from his comments and the. In the spring, we know how committed he is mm-hmm. yeah, uh, sure. to the to doing the best he can to grind it out. Um, I, I think numbers are less important than the play of the offensive line. Um, the two things that have to be in place for Nebraska to be successful, offensive line, I say that every time, um, and and the defense needs to step up. If you if you have good offensive line play and and a solid defense, in the Big Ten, you're probably going to be successful. You're going to have some success. And, you know, in that context, if Nebraska gets that play from the offensive line and whoever's that quarterback, you've got a, a host of running backs there. The competition, we've talked about that, the competition in the fall is going to be very spirited um, at running back to see who, who steps up. And you've got some guys, some young receivers. You've got competition there. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure about depth at tight end, you know, how that's going to shake out. Um, but it seems like Nebraska has the pieces to be effective, to be successful, um, however you want to define it. I don't define it as going nine, nine win, nine and three and, and win the division. But, but I think Nebraska can be very competitive if you get the play from the offensive line protect that quarterback to allow him to do whatever it is he feels like he does best and the defense to back him up. Mike Babcock's with us from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine at MD Babs on Twitter. The numbers here with Bill Conley suggest Nebraska 
under Frost should have been on average a seven win team. They should have about 23 to 24 wins in the Frost era. They're at 15. Conley says that's not randomness. It's you. So it's better coaching. It's better playmaking. It's better uh, fundamentals when it comes to blocking, tackling, taking care of the football. Let's just ma- wave the magic wand for a moment. What's the what's the temperature and, and fan base feel right now going into year five if Nebraska would have been a seven-win team? Say you, you trade the, the, the fours and the fives and the three for seven. Yay, that's, that's postseason. Is there still grumbling? Is there still une- uneasiness going into a year five, even if you've been at seven wins? Well, um, yeah, I think there's going to be some grumbling. There's going to be grumbling no matter what. I mean, you you always think of a reason. Tom Osborne, people were upset with Osborne because they always won nine games and didn't win a national championship, they always played in bowl games and had opportunities. Um, so you're always going to have that. I, I think if, yeah, if it's it's only been seven wins, that would be the reflection of, of the uh, – well, look at it. Bo Pelini always won nine nine games and got at least got to a bowl game. You know that's, you know we got to be at least back to that point. I think that I think that's the mentality of the fans. So if it's just seven wins every year, they look at it and say, well, we're not back to where we need to be. Um, but now we look at it and say, well, seven wins looks like a pretty good deal. I <laughs> mean, um, you know, I think in in defense of Scott Frost, one of the things you have to consider is. That being a head coach, his time as a head coach was very limited, mm-hmm. and and his time as a head coach was at UCF, which was a little bit different kind of a situation. Obviously, how you can win in that conference um, and how you win in the Big Ten are dramatically different. So there's an adjustment period for him, um, whether it's four years or not. Whether you say that, um, I don't know, but uh, there's some time, some adjustment on the part of the coach and his staff trying to get settled into a staff that he's comfortable with. Um, you know, there've been, we've seen the changes. We've talked about that. So there's just a lot of things, but yeah, some, had they been all seven wins, I think people would have said, no, this is stagnant. You know, this is, we got to get, we got to get into the, the nine wins and we got to, we got to be in uh, con- challenging for the conference championship and at least be in the division uh, championship run and, and get into the title game. So, Mike, in 2022, is the conversation surrounding the, the security of Scott Frost's job, is it more nuanced than wins and losses? I mean, last season, if you would have told me preseason, Nebraska's going to go 3-9 and nine this year, I said, well, more likely than not, Scott Frost will probably be shown the door. But we saw the nuance in that last season where Nebraska, with all the one-score losses, they looked better as a team despite the fact that the wins and losses weren't there. Does that still hold up this year, or does it come down to the wins and losses in 2022? I think it comes down to wins and losses 2022. I, I think, you know, people will move on, obviously, now and say, hey, um, just win, baby. That's the bottom line. you got to get the job done. And uh, there's probably more pressure from that standpoint because there were, they, the team was so close in those games and still finished 3-9, and nine, found out ways to not get it done. Um, I think there's probably a little bit more pressure coming off that because – People say, well, it was a lot better than a three and nine team. So we expect something from from this. And with the coaching changes, um, that adds another factor to it. You know, well, you got rid of all these guys before the season even, even ended. Um, what is that going to say about what you've got now? You must have brought in better coaches. We expect better performance. Mike, going to get to college football realignment. Some new neighbors to the West for Nebraska since we last talked. USC and UCLA. Uh, a, a thought with, uh, with with that. I mean, if you pod this thing up, is is it going to? Do you like the fact that Nebraska and UCLA and, and USC could be playing each other along with an Iowa every year, every? One one uh, game's out in the Rose Bowl, one game's in Lincoln, uh, be it USC coming under the lights. I mean, uh, this is the new normal. Do you think uh, Nebraska can, can thrive with it? You know, that's a, that's a tough that's a tough go because the distance uh, for Nebraska and Iowa, for USC and UCLA, um, the pods, the rest of the conference sort of, I, I'm not sure how they fit together mm-hmm. because 
you don't want to start. I don't think you want to break up Illinois and Northwestern, Northwestern, right, or Indiana mm -hmm. and Purdue. Um, and that's one of the things that I think about when I hear about, well, you know, uh, our Washington and Oregon coming somewhere. Uh, you know, what about Oregon State and Washington State? What about those rivalries that have uh, you just dismiss those things? Um, I saw a piece where some question about whether Stanford's even interested in moving, whether Stanford would even keep playing football. But you got Stanford and California together. Mm -hmm. You know, the one suggestion was Arizona and Arizona State going together. Um, that makes sense. That's the thing I don't like. I don't like to see is all these uh, longtime rivalries breaking up, and we know Michigan and Ohio State's not going to be broken. Mike, hang on for us. We're gonna we're up against a hard break. We'll take a couple more minutes on the other side if you got it. Sure. That's all right. Fine. More with Babbers on the way. Calling all soccer fans. Union Omaha is back home after an unbelievable showing in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup round of 16. An upset over Minnesota United? That's our team. So join them when they come home May 28th for Educational Outreach Night. Presented by Bellevue University. The Owls will face Northern Colorado Hailstorm FC. And after a couple of road matches, will come back on June 18th to face Greenville Triumph SC. It's it's also Pride Night. We'll see you there. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. A couple more minutes with Mike Babcock. We're streaming ESPN Lincoln's Facebook and Twitter and conference realignment. Mike, uh, last thought here real quick, bud. Uh, with the ACC, could they go absorb who they want from the Pac-12 and and, AC, uh, and, uh, and the Big 12 and Pac-12? Could that could that be a third league? Could you see a third league emerge? I'm going to answer your question with a question of my own to you and Elijah. Do you think that all of this is just kind of dancing around the real subject, which is at some point there are going to be X number, 64 uh, schools that are going to pull away from the NCAA, put together their own organization, um, and have their own playoff system and have their own TV contracts. Yep, that's what's going to happen. Absolutely. That's that's the plan. The, the, the benefit is big is bigger picture. It's an, it's an expanded playoff. It's more money. Whether you think that's a good or bad thing, it, it, it is going to be a good thing for Nebraska, right? You're going to have uh, better matchups, right? You're going to have some good ball games every week. Because it's a it's a name school versus a name school theoretically, and uh, you're going to hopefully have either a committee or a czar that will oversee things, and then you could streamline what's fair and real in recruiting an NIL. I mean, those are all things that need reform. So that's that's the that's the fallout on top of having 64 best, and you you chop it apart with more money. Yeah, I, I'm. To me, that's what it is. I mean, you're just trying to position yourself so that when you get in that discussion, I, I think these conferences are going to be essentially at some point just dissolve into mm -hmm. a, a larger organization you will be defined. Like the Big Ten right now could be effectively two conferences, right? The, the West Division and the East mm -hmm. Division, you've got 18 conferences. Or if you're talking about pods, that's a whole different thing. So I, I just think that it's – what we conclude today, a week from now or two weeks from now or a year from now, is going to be just discussion that's been changed because the whole world of college football at that level has been changed. It'll be hindsight because there'll be something new or different or Notre Dame will get off the pot, so to speak, and figure out where they're going. Mike Babcock with us. Babbers, great to get caught up. Thanks for your time, as always. Always uh, love talking some ball with you. Thanks for having me, guys. Be safe. There he is. Mike Babcock joins us on Hale Varsity Radio. Good to spend a few minutes with him. We'll uh, dive in and uh, spend a few minutes with Mike Shuhart. Uh, Gentleman Jim is going to join the show here. That's Jim Walden, longtime coach at Iowa State, longtime coach at Washington State and uh, an assistant for a number of years under Bob Devaney, played quarterback for Bob. Old Jimbo, uh, Jim Walden, <laughs> seen it all in the Pac-10 and then Pac-12. 
and then also the the Big Eight before they jumped to the Big Twelve. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is on the docket. We'll get his read and feel on uh, the direction, and and also a thought or two on on Nebraska football as uh, Husker football uh, makes their way into 2022 numbers to get in four six six three seven seven six four six six three seven seven six eight hundred eight two five five eight six five we'll see if we can uh, locate shuey he may be on that lazy river oh that's a, that's a good possibility i was wondering because it sounds like his phone may be on do not disturb mode so uh the, the, the lazy river actually makes the most sense of anything if there's anywhere i wouldn't want to be disturbed. my question though is um aren't all like smartphones now pretty much waterproof so so you would think so i would think so you would think so but then uh, my buddy jacob this week i was out at the lake uh fourth of july and uh dove off the boat left his phone in his pocket and oh. he had phone issues for a couple of days so it's mostly waterproof it didn't completely destroy the phone but there's, his phone was acting goofy there's a difference between water resistant and yep waterproof yep. <laughs> <laughs> right water resistant means uh-oh uh time to get a new phone for quite a bit back to bill conley's review of the big 10 west and listen you, you have the the turnover margin being key with iowa last season and uh, you have iowa losing to wisconsin and purdue they didn't just lose they got dismantled 51 to 14 and then you, you, they found a way to, to eke out four tight wins in November and think of the comeback against Lincoln. Sorry, take a drink. Uh, along the way, turnovers told the tale. That'll be it for Nebraska. Think of the Purdue game, minus four. Think of the Wisconsin game as back and forth. That was a shootout. As back and forth as that was, turnovers and special teams decided it. Uh, you had turnovers decided against Sparty. Turnovers absolutely decided it. The crucial one is you're driving for the win against Michigan. And then, of course, you know what the the red zone situation was like against Minnesota. And, And that is it. That is it. It's turnovers. It's special teams. Special teams drilled down upon by Bill Conley again with Nebraska. You can look at look at Illinois. I mean, Illinois was damn near bowl eligible with the pig farmer. And they went five and seven. They used defense and special teams to keep it close. They almost eked out that bowl bid despite finishing 64th overall. Northwestern fell apart defensively. They weren't good on offense. You know what kind of a mess they were. But Wisconsin's quarterback, not great. You've got experience in Tanner Lee with some decent weapons around him. Iowa is going to try and balance uh, potentially elite defense and an offense that has question marks. Where's Nebraska at? Well, well, there's... Do, they, do they have an elite defense? No, but they have a good, what's returning, a good defense. If you get some bump from what comes in, right? Defensively, Nebraska can't be worse than last year. They need to be as good or better, which is a tough ask, but it's it, maybe it's doable. Uh, defensively, you just got to be better at quarterback and way better on the offensive line. And man, that's that's easier said than done. And you and I are both, I think, we're not buying that stock until until it happens. Well, well there's reasons for. I mean, really, any team in the Big Ten West where I say, yeah, this team could win the Big Ten West, or this team could fall well short of expectations. With Wisconsin, they return. Uh, very little on defense. Uh, they have, a, I believe, a new offensive coordinator coming in. And, but, they got Allen. But they got Braylon Allen. So you say they could carry their way to the Big Ten uh, championship game with Braylon Allen, or they could fall flat because of that defense. With Iowa, it's almost opposite. Their, their defense is elite, as you said, but what do they have at quarterback? What do they have on offense? Big question mark. You really don't know. Nebraska, uh, in terms of athletic talent they probably out talent every other team in the big 10 if you look at recruiting rankings and what these guys can do physically and athletically but you have no idea what they have on the offensive line and a lot of question marks on that defense who's going to step up purdue lost a lot of their skill but they still have aiden o'connell their quarterback coming back i mean really with almost all these teams in the big 10 there's a reason that they could go out and win the big 10 west but they also have detractors that let me lead me to believe that they're not going to do it yeah purdue has experience uh and 
That's really it. Nebraska, quite frankly, capable of anything. We'll wind down hour one next on Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, got an email here from Kent. He chimes in, and he was lucky to be where they are and not be like Oki State right now. Bad brand, regardless of fandom right now. And Oki State's a good program that's very consistent between that seven and nine win total. But you're uh, you're kind of out on, on an island hoping your league stays together. And from an academic prowess standpoint and a reputation standpoint and a TV market standpoint, Minoki State's a hard sell other than the mullet in their football program. I mean, they've got some basketball history. They're, they're historically really good in baseball, but they're, they're the other Oklahoma. They've just, despite that being the other Oklahoma, they've won a lot of football games and found a lot of dudes uh, from the state of Texas and wherever to – to, to be really sexy and fun and, and pretty prolific offensively. And, and that brings up a, a good hypothetical question for Husker fans out there. Would you rather be a football program that's winning eight, nine games a year, occasionally getting to that 10-11 win mark, but you're in Oklahoma State shoes where you got stuck in the Big 12 and you're kind of in no man's land in terms of this conference realignment, or would you rather be in Nebraska in, in a secure spot in the Big 10? You know you're going to be financially well off for – uh, as long as you remain in the Big Ten, but your football program's scuffling. Which which side of things would you like to be on, Husker Nation? That's, that's a great question just to ask out there, and I know everyone would probably say, well, let's have the best of both worlds. But as it stands right now, what would you rather have? You know, just give me – give me give it to me all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> give, give me the, the 9 to 10 to 11 and give me the history because the history is what the, – the recency and the history is what got you into the Big Ten mm-hmm. 12 years ago. Right, you weren't that far removed from. I mean, well, you were just playing for a conference championship in back-to-back year. Well, two out of the last three years, right? You, you played in 2010, you played in, uh, in in 09, so back-to-back and three in a four-year stretch. Because year two in the Big Ten, you, you played for the the Big Ten title, didn't go so well, and that's been a, a ten-year memory uh, that Jack Daniels tries to to erase every time Wisconsin pops on your screen. So. No, I mean, the thing that, that hurts Oklahoma State is the fact that they've been Oklahoma State. <laughs> I mean, they, right? I mean, the Barry Sanders years, a lot of fun. Thurman Thomas was cool. Jimmy Johnson once coached there. And and now you got the, the mullet, right? I mean, the, the Gundy's mullet has its own headset. But but they've spent 30 years as little brother in their own state. Well, and it's and think about it. I mean, 08 was a while ago when, when Grandpa Boone paid for all the stadium up, stadium upgrades mm-hmm. so well yeah and the other part of this too don't don't catch don't kid yourself there, there's a lot of other programs you can invite into your league and go get that bring way more value and may not light you up by 40 i mean great we're bringing oklahoma state to the league they're going to put a half a hundred on us because guess what they've got nfl receivers and some guy that can throw a punt up there a 4 40 guy can run under and you blink and it's another big play, so that's that's a reality with Oklahoma State. They're they're a tough sell. On cue, the wife. Do you want to meet for dinner? <laughs> Great, she text messages me. Feels like she could free to call and check in and. Well, you're and, doing a show. Yeah, while while I'm doing a show, not hey, yeah, uh, Oklahoma State's a tough sell. Not. <laughs> Man, I think I think Arizona's going to the Big 12. It's you want to take me for tacos. Hey, it's Schmitty. Want to tell you about a fantastic opportunity to work for a rapidly growing company that also enjoys the benefits earned with having competitive, stable history of work over 20 years? FSC. The FSC Edge, it's a leading technology innovator serving governmental agencies. Expert services helping worldwide patent offices meet strict processing and publishing timelines while delivering exceptional quality. They support some of the world's largest patent offices throughout the U.S. and Europe. That includes the European Patent Office. Office, the German Patent and Trademark Office, and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The only group of companies worldwide to provide such support to all three of these agencies. Working at FSC, you have a chance to work with fun people with great attitudes and learn about patents. You're not on the phone, you're not customer-facing, it's casual dress, and the work 
environment, it's a new environment with over $2 million in improvements. You have access to generous benefits packages, company support for health and wellness, and you do impactful work on a national scale. Make a difference. Their team's constantly growing and they're always looking for new people to join their mission. Check out what's available today at jobs at fsc.com. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5 Here's Chris Schmitz. Back into an hour two, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. More on conference realignment. Let's talk to the gentleman and uh, head coach Jim Walden with us. Of course, played quarterback for Coach Devaney, coached with Coach Devaney, and longtime uh, head man at Washington State and Iowa State. Coach, it's awesome to talk to you. You're getting some golf in. How, how's the summer treating you? Well, you know, I live in North Idaho in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And you know what's strange? Of all the droughts and everything, you mm. shouldn't have asked me that. We have actually had too much rain. And that, <laughs> that sounds terrible to all those people where they're just struggling. But uh, we just now, and we used to always say that, summer starts out here the 4th of July. Uh, but this year more than ever. we Chris, we just had a whole boatload of rain and cold weather. And finally, in the last couple of days, it's been really nice. Well, that is good to hear, and that's just beautiful country up there. Coach, you have uh, lived a lot of your life in, in the Pac-12. You've lived a lot of your life in the, the Big 8 and Big 12. How, uh, how are you feeling about uh, what college football's turned into with this realignment, specifically USC and UCLA making the move a week ago? Well, I'm kind of sad, uh, Schmidt, if you really want to know the truth. I think it's a sad state of affairs. I, I guess down deep I understand it. They've all got to pay for all these things. Um, I think it's led by way in, in inflated salaries for coaches uh, of all kinds. I think that started the ball rolling, and, and then uh, t- television started paying all these gobs of money and and so that's where it started, and that's, as usual, the, the pattern. <clears throat> Guys start making more money than they probably should be making. Then the next group makes more money. Now we get the, the players starting to make money, uh, and there's only so many donors. There's only so much money that people can give. And then so what happens is that you start doing this stuff uh, with all this inner, depart- inner uh, leagues. Mm-hmm. It destroys so much of what I think, if you're 35 and older, you probably have gotten a, a, ingrained into the rivalries, Chris, mm-hmm. and, and the, the fun things of college football, and I see that slipping away. <laughs> Coach, how, how do we uh, shake out the, the next move? What do you feel uh, happens to the rest of the Pac-12? Well, I think there's two chains of thought. Um I had my first thought was, uh, I, I hate this because I, I went to the University of Wyoming, so I hate the thoughts of robbing another conference. I just hate that. And it's been going on and people jumping and jumping. And you just hate it. But my thought was, okay, they'll pull in Fresno. They'll pull in San Diego State. They'll probably pick up about six million <clears throat> of those eight million television sets that they lost. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so then at, at that point, and the dirty word, which you almost have to hold your nose to say it, Chris, was maybe down deep they might even have to give some thought to UNLV because the big market of Las Vegas is getting bigger than anything because so many people will follow their team there. And so I, I, as bad as I hated to say it, and I held my nose when I did it, mm-hmm. but um, that's what I thought. But now I hear rumors today that there's some talks about joining the two leagues, the Atlantic Coast Conference and Pac-12, and that might be the best scenario of all. Well, you have some – this is a, another dirty word, as we're having a dirty word segment, stability, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. th- there might be a little bit there with the ACC because of the exit fees. So you're 
not prone to, to get into legal action if you're the ACC with uh, the teams that are currently in there. You know, say the SEC comes knocking for a Clemson or Miami or or Florida mm-hmm. State, you're you're locked in with your grant of rights. Notre Dame sitting out there dating who they want, right? So they're kind of yeah. hanging out. And, and that's what I had heard, too, a Pac-12 ACC merger. You have some of the best properties left in college football in the ACC. I'd also heard that you had the Big 12 that could get uh, proactive because they are going to be first up here to renew their rights. Uh, and and you have the the TV rights expiring for the Pac-12 in 2023, and you've lost SC and UCLA. So, does the Big 12 go get Colorado and Utah? Uh, do they go get uh, a couple of other schools uh, to to solidify their Arizona State, Arizona? Those are the four that may get added <laughs> to the to the Big 12, and. Uh, What's what's best? And the other question, too, is is Washington and Oregon. They're waiting on a Big Ten invite, but I don't know that that's going to happen. No, and you know what? They, when you sit down and think about it, Chris, Oregon and Washington are good names. They don't have that much to offer. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. They don't have that many TV sets, uh, and both of them are split states. They've got a, they have a state in each one of them, an Oregon state and a Washington state. And there's a when you sit down to who watches the, the Ducks or who watches the the, the Huskies, uh, I, I'm sorry, but they're not that uh, admirable, if you want to use that word, if there's such a word, uh, I, I, in terms of uh, two guys that think they can control what they do. No, I'm not saying they're not quality places. They are. But on the other hand, what do they bring? Um you bring a state like Oregon, it's very limited population, and then you split that with the Oregon State Beavers, you do the same thing at Washington. Yeah, you're on the side on Seattle with the side where the population is, but even at that, um, you're still not controlling uh, those kind of situations. I, I'm i sorry, but I I really like the idea of the uh, – this is my suggestion mm-hmm. was if you're going to go to the ACC, to heck with that. Why don't you go with your neighbor and go to the Big 12? Um, and so, uh, Chris, I, I just think what would be more natural than to play the Big 12 Conference and the and the Pac-12 join it up? You've got Colorado in it. You've got Utah in it. You've got the two Arizonas, as you just said. Well, why don't you just bring in the other five or six? And you've got – then you get Stanford, you get Cal, and you get the four Northwest. What you're going to do that, just, let's just combine the two leagues and I, I think it makes more sense to me to have the Big 12 and the Pac-12 join up uh, instead of split it out. And that's just that's my feeling, and maybe that's because I'm trying to hopefully protect Washington State a little bit and Oregon State for that matter. But you, you look at the whole picture and you say, okay, you get the Bay Area, uh, you get the whole Northwest, you get all of Arizona. And that's not a bad deal to pick up. And so instead of the SEC having a 20-team conference, why don't the Pac-12, I mean the Big 12, have a have a 20-team conference? Jim Walden's with us, longtime coach, Iowa State and Washington State, assistant for Coach Devaney, Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, what type of football do you think the Big Ten is going to get from USC and UCLA? Nebraska started out okay. Uh, when they transition into the Big Ten, but you've got to go get different body types to live in the Big Ten. You and I know that on the lines of scrimmage. How do you see uh, into the future for SC and UCLA in the Big Ten? Are they going to come in and and be really good, or are they going to have an adjustment period? Well, they're going to have an adjustment period because of the the style of play, Chris, that, uh, that, that these teams use back there, and uh, USC, of course, has got, as you all know, Oklahoma's coach is now at USC. He hadn't coached it down in the, in the Pac-12 yet. And he said now he's back in the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. So he went from the Big 12 to Pac-12 to Big Ten. He hadn't coached it down. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. But And UCLA is just, in the reality, the two schools that are so do- have been dominant, but they haven't been that dominant in the last several years. And uh, they've been competitive but not like the, the old USC teams were. And so I, I don't see them come roaring into the, 
to the Big Ten and just splashing everything because I, Scott Frost would tell you, you may come in with ideas, but maybe when, uh, when it settles down, uh, you're going to play the game according to Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, Penn State. They know how to play the game. They've been at it a long time. And so you will adjust. Just, I think that's exactly what Nebraska's doing. I like everything I hear about what's, what Scott's done. I'm sorry he had to let some coaches go. You always hate that. But sometimes you just have to change things to step it to the point where you want to be. And so I think UCLA and USC may have the same thoughts and, and come in with the same thoughts, but they may not have any different results than Scott Frost had at Nebraska. It's been an adjustment. Every team that's ever jumped like that has had to have an adjustment. I think about Colorado when they jumped into the Pac-12. Uh, it was a whole different thing for them. And so uh, there will be an, an adjustment period for both of those two schools. The, the, the thing that we've all laughed about out here is last time we checked, <laughs> Schmitty, there's no beach volleyball at Wisconsin, is there? <laughs> Do you have beach volleyball? It's, it, it's on ice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in a four foot of snow, and, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's shirtless, uh, burly dudes uh, playing, uh, playing in the ice. <laughs> Yeah, well, we we just wonder about the rest of the sports when you send your women's basketball team and your and your lacrosse team all the way out to 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 uh, the <laughs> the Rutgers. Uh, how the <laughs> other sports in those two schools feel about five and a half, four and a half hour flight uh, when they used to go uh, thirty minutes? You mm-hmm. know, so uh, it's going to be interesting when you start talking about this money. You have to always realize, yeah, they're going to make twenty million more dollars. But how much travel, how much does travel cost for the other 100 athletes that's going to be on different teams going east? And then, because everybody in the east, only had, Nebraska only has to come out to the west one time. Mm-hmm. But UCLA and USC have to go out six times. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the rest of your sports. It is not going to be inexpensive to send your women's. Uh, everything that women, that they will have to compete in, mm-hmm. I'm sure at this point in time, if you were the head coach of women's uh, beach volleyball, you might feel threatened right now. Yeah, Coach Jim Walden's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Co- coach, you bring up a good point there, but I want to go back briefly to this uh, uh, adjustment period for USC and UCLA in, in the Big Ten. And I want you to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of Lincoln Riley or, or Chip Kelly for that mm-hmm. matter. If you're one of those two guys, what steps would you take over the next two years to prepare yourself uh, to, to join the Big Ten so maybe that adjustment period isn't so harsh? Well, in the first place, they won't either one. Uh, uh, the USC coach will probably think he has a better handle on it because he's been at Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. He will have a better understanding of the Big Ten. He's been involved with kind of that mindset. <clears throat> but also, he's not a. He, um, I just don't think they understand how good, how physical teams are, even the ones that you don't mention. You know, I mentioned the four. But I didn't mention Nebraska. I didn't mention Iowa. I didn't mention Wisconsin. I didn't mention Minnesota. I didn't mention Indiana. And and, and what happens with these teams like USC, they've only ever had to play one of those teams on an average basis, and that was in the Rose Bowl or something. UCLA, the same thing. Lincoln Riley may think he knows, but I'm telling you what you think you know and having to play that kind of competition every week uh, and not having known – Recruiting-wise, what have you got now that competes with what you're going to face? How long will it take you to get those guys there? And let me tell you something. Just because you're going to the Big Ten doesn't mean that a guy in L.A. doesn't still want to go to Arizona State or Washington or Oregon. So just because you're moving into another conference does not necessarily mean that you're going to get the best kids in the city of L.A. Now, you'll get your share, but that doesn't mean you're going to get all the best ones because – Guys like to stay home and play close to home, so we'll see. Coach, I want to ask a broad question about the Pac-12 and why and how did it get to this, and I ask that with what each team was earning, about $30 million, and with with the way Oregon's risen, you've had Washington be in the college football playoff. Washington Mm -hmm. State had been a pretty decent squad, eight, seven, eight wins. Uh, and, and of course, you, you have SC that's not been Pete Carroll SC, but it's still USC. And UCLA, mm-hmm. I, I think, is always underachieved, but they have the 
the ability to have a really good year because they recruited so well. They got a ton of guys in the NFL. So why was why was the low ball number what it was for so many years with the Pac-12 when it came to to TV rights? Well, this is just me, but I think we've had a horrible commissioner. If you, I, I'm sorry, I, and I'm not going to get into that. But mm. as far as being productive, I think the commissioner at the Pac-12 conference in all phases of everything has been way behind. He was a he was out of step with the rest of the world. Uh, and to give you one example, all the time Pac-12 has been out here. Dish Network does not handle Pac, does not carry Pac-12 uh, football. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? No. And and so uh, things like that, where you don't negotiate and try to come up with the with the answer to do it. The 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 blessing is, I think they have hired a truly really good uh, uh, commissioner. Unfortunately, this is happening on his in his backyard before he even gets started. Yeah. But I think I think going forward, uh, I would have to say, Chris, that it most of the problems of the Pac-12 conference was all about selling what he had, and I don't think commissioner that was here. I think in my mind said all he cared about selling was himself. Uh, he was more glorified in his own private plane in a in a, in a, in a up in the penthouse of a downtown San Francisco hotel than he was worried about uh, uh, getting things done for the conferences. Um, and I think he kind of appealed to the four or five uh, money teams and forgot about the other eight a little bit more than most of them like to, to admit. But that's what happened, and it was just a combination of not getting out there, not selling your product, not believing in yourself, not, not working on things, and then that's what I think happened. <laughs> Hello, listener. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to let you know about a special deal just for listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast. We're offering $10 off the annual subscription price. That means that you can get everything we do. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. Chime in 402-466-ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back in Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. A few more minutes with the longtime coach at Iowa State and Washington State and an assistant and a quarterback for Bob Devaney, Gentleman Jim Walden with us here on Hale Varsity. Coach, uh, what are your expectations for Nebraska? We uh, have our bags packed for Ireland, so we're excited for that. And uh, we'll see after the game how excited we are. But, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of pressure this year on old Frosty. But I think uh, you touched on the, the coaching changes that were made. We're really high on uh, Brian Applewhite at running backs coach. Uh, really like Mickey Joseph. Uh, just doing a great job on the recruiting trail. Bill Bush is now a full-time coach for special teams. So things uh, look good. You, you've hit the, the jackpot with some high-profile kids in the transfer portal. We'll see if it turns out to be uh, Michigan State good or not, right? So as you yeah. look at all of these um, these moves for Nebraska, how do you think uh, 2022 shapes up for the Big Red? Well, I'd like to think with all the experience that the, that the – staff he's brought in has and with Scott's knowledge of now what he's up against and how to relate and and maybe release some things to that staff Mm -hmm. that that he's learned the combination of his knowledge of what he thinks it takes based on what he's learned and the basis of the new staff already knowing in certain situations the the strengths of what they're they are which you just mentioned I think leads to me to believe it gets back down to this. Do we have a good quarterback? And do we have some guys who can catch the ball? And do we have some guys <laughs> that can rush the passer and block for the quarterback? Now, that's football in itself. I mean, when it gets finally gets down to that, how are they going to perform? You can name them and you can put them where they're supposed to be, but if they're not a team that believes in performing, 
together to, to believe that they can win and they can beat anybody and that they can get over this hump of losing close ball games late. Uh, they've got to master that. They've got to have the confidence all, all the way through. And, and if they can master that, I think I'm, I think I could easily see a nine-win season. I never like to go out there and say undefeated. That's a bunch of crap. But if you if you just say to yourself right now, will you accept nine wins at Nebraska this year? And if the answer to that's no, then your expectations are way too high. If you love nine wins, then you can. That's what I think. I think I think they can fight through this and win nine football games, and then they're on their way. Coach, what'd you say to kids? Uh... When, when you had some, some, some of your better teams that may have lost a, a tight, tough ball game early in the year, how did you rally them? Because you, you're right, that is Nebraska, in, in a nutshell, getting over that hump. It's turnovers, it's uh, quarterback play, it's, it's getting after the quarterback, it's, it's not allowing pressures on your quarterback 40% of the time you drop back. I mean, that's all mm-hmm. last year, but that was part of the three and nine. Uh, those crucial moments went the wrong way. How did you? Uh, how did you? You coach your kids. Up, how did you coach your kids up uh, for the next time it, it came uh, around the bend? Well, the biggest thing you have is a meeting and talk about why, and you try to sit there. They're not going to tell you. They don't know because every one of them can't admit to themselves that they get nervous and that they want to win so bad that they they panic. And we used to call it your your long arms start to get short. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened in a lot of games last year and several in a couple of years for the Nebraska, that they're somehow or another, they hit that point, Smitty, where they want to win so badly, and then they just kind of crunch, and all of a sudden their arms get short. And so they just don't keep free-flowing. So I think if Frost does anything and the other coaching staff with him, they've got to talk a lot about finishing the game, finish what you started, play with confidence, expect to be ahead in the fourth quarter. Don't be a surprise. You, my goal will always, don't you dare act like you're, you're, you're when, you, when you're ahead of a really good football team in the fourth quarter, I want you to expect to be there. I want you to think that's what we played for. And so that was my message all the time. Expect to be ahead in the fourth and then take it from there. Let's take it home. And I think that's what Nebraska has to do. Get an expectation of being ahead in the fourth quarter, and you'll be surprised how easy it is to finish the deal. Jim Walden with us, uh, great coach uh, for Nebraska, Iowa State, Washington State. Great perspective on college football's changes. Coach, enjoy the rest of your summertime. We'll talk here uh, closer to kickoff, and always love having you on. Thanks for a few minutes today, Coach. No problem. You guys have a great, great summer, and uh, enjoy, enjoy, okay? Thanks, Coach. See you later, Smitty. Jim Walden with us. Uh, Jimbo's the best uh, storyteller and uh, great part of the Devaney era and still loves and eats, sleeps, breathes college football, part of Washington State's program. Of course, Iowa State head coach at both and really keeps an eye on Nebraska. So he's he's anxious, man. He's anxious for Nebraska to be good again. But for him to lay it out there like that, you know, in in all the years of covering Nebraska, you see a lot of the teams that, that came into Memorial Stadium from from the Big Ten. And, you know, towards the end of the ball game, you'd get down to the sidelines or you'd be down there and, and you'd see folks run into to the to the locker room. And one team that always I, I loved observing was was Northwestern. And Northwestern and Pat Fitzgerald have done well in Lincoln. Aside from the Hail Mary game and aside from last year, uh, one of their worst teams in between the two trips to the Big Ten championship game, a 3-9 and nine squad, barely lost to Nebraska 13-10. to 10. You think of the Lamar Jackson interception game, right? And the sea of hands field goal with some kid from the soccer club that, that booted it and, and it made it up in Nebraska got a win. I think that was 2019. <laughs> but Northwestern, every time they run onto the field, they got some dude, and I'm not talking about the the guy with the shaved head and beard, the the, the wannabe D-line coach 
that is the the strength and conditioning guy that would wear shorts in sub zero weather. Not not that guy. But they got team assistants holding up signs. Northwestern does this. Every time they come out or they go in, it's it's a sign that you got to hit. Trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, what the hell is this? What, what is this motivational moment? But listen, <laughs> what do I know? But something from a reinforcement standpoint as simple as trust yourself. That's what Jim Walden just laid out. Well, with with when push comes to shove, you don't want to screw up. You don't want to fail, and you want you have the ability to go make a, a game winning, game changing, momentum spurring play. You do, but sometimes you spend too much thinking about it. Hey. So too much time thinking about it, and and that's that's really it with Nebraska uh, is in the moment, and and I think. What I'm anxious for, Elijah, and I'll shut up, you jump in, is, all right, you've got chemistry that's got to be king with all these new dudes. But some guys are going to hopefully bring some winning ways, right? I know Texas hasn't been great, but they're not far removed from from winning or, or, or winning high school program or no doubt the Alabama kids. <laughs> they, they've won a lot. They've been around a lot. TCU, I know it's not been great, but some of the, specifically O'Shawn, I mean, the guy knows how to win on third and eight, right, individually. So I'm hoping the 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 trench, the 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 underground workers, the guys that have been here for a hundred years that want to get a winning season, and their work ethic and their lead by example, the Garrett Nelsons of the world, Caleb Tanners of the world. I hope their chemistry and philosophy blends with the the Bama culture that that a guy like Wynn's been a part of. And I hope that can be kind of a new good thing for Nebraska where they go out and and really don't have a fear of failure. And the question to me is, can an infusion of confidence into the team be enough? Because it's not like last year's team was was low on confidence for the most part. They just had crucial moments where it felt like there was no confidence. They I mean, just needed to ice their nether regions after every weekend look, because they kept getting kicked there. Look at the Michigan State game. Nebraska played with confidence up until that overtime. Well, I think and they, then once overtime came around, it seemed like the confidence all left. Same with Michigan. Michigan, they looked confident all the way up until that end of the game, that final drive, and then all the confidence was gone. Minnesota, it's a, kind of another story. It looked like there was no confidence in the first half. They, were, they brought they it were, back in the second. They were done. They were they were they were they were flat. They were done. They were they were robbed twice. Mm-hmm. They helped rob themselves. They were done, and then they got up off the mat after that first half. That was just a sleepwalk session, and coulda shoulda woulda right. And now I I'm interested here with Nebraska, and can they just flush it and and go be confident? And he he nailed it. Expect to be winning in the fourth quarter. Well, so many times Nebraska's been trailing. <laughs> Think about it. They they don't go to they don't go to halftime ahead a lot. They don't they don't jump out on a team. They're always coming back to try and tie or take the lead. They've not they've not been ahead. It's not gay. I mean, I I was a glaring example of. It going the other way where you're up two touchdowns and you fumble that away or the Northwestern game back in 2018. But for the most part, you've not been up. When you've been up, you've been pretty good. You run for 200 yards and you lead at halftime, your record's all right. I mean, that's most of Scott Frost's 15 wins. And, yeah, that's something these guys at the college level that have been at Nebraska haven't experienced. And for sure, there's been enough doubt to creep into their mind over the years. You'd love to say, hey, it's going to be different this time. You'd love to say, hey, we've we've got this. But there's been too many examples of just for the, the Murphy's Law take. What can go wrong has gone wrong, does go wrong. Well, that's that's got to be yesterday's news, yesterday's narrative. It's new. It's different. And guys that the other part of that, too, is is kind of reloading 
or or injecting some some new talent into some old positions that after a lot of years here have graduated with the Stillies and the JoJo's the, the the Cam Taylor Brits. I mean that's that's not an easy task. Nebraska, interestingly enough, good story here by the World Herald with the, the roster notes. 151 guys on the roster. You have three uh, four linemen going the other way weight wise. Utofsky, Hickson, Ben Hart all drop at about 15 pounds. Big old Teddy Prohaska is up 15 pounds to 320. A jock doc's on the way with Hale Varsity. Pardon the interruption, but I'd like to save you some money. I'm Brandon Vogel, Managing Editor of Hale Varsity. And I wanted to offer listeners of this podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you can get everything we produce. 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all of the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe and enter the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hale Varsity. That's HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe, promo code GBR. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hale Varsity Radio. I got the body of a caught preteen Swedish boy. Back into it is Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday. Nebraska Orthopedic Center, Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, uh, good 4th of July for you. That was great, buddy. How was your fourth? Doing all, it was good. Played a little golf, got a little grilling in, some pool time, and I, uh, I didn't hurt uh, hurt myself or, or others. We didn't have the, the neighbor park the uh, the loaded vehicle full of fireworks uh, in the driveway like it's been on Twitter all day today. And a, uh, I haven't a, seen that one. A, well, I will send it to you. A, a stray flare set off uh, the back of the old Volvo. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was quite hilarious. Uh, unless it That's was your a heck of a show. Yeah, yeah, just in your driveway, <laughs> the wrong kind. <laughs> well, we have wow. uh, part two to uh, the Phil's Bryce Harper. He has uh, had pins inserted into his broken thumb, and uh, Harper, the reigning National League MVP, vowing return a return this season. So let's start there. How likely is a return this season, in your opinion, uh, for Harper when we know now that he, that he has pins in his thumb? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Chris. You know, going to be a, a tight kind of schedule, you know, getting him back. Um, you know, the big thing always with, with the pin placement, um, you know, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can take and place those pins underneath the skin, Um then you're obviously putting a couple of sutures over the top of those to close it up. And even with that, it depends how aggressive you want to be in terms of letting them go back. Typically with those, you're going to want to wait at least you know three or four weeks, let the incisions heal up well, whether it's pins under the skin or above. Um, then there comes a the process having to take out the pins later. Um, and as you kind of go through that process, it's a matter of, you know, when do you do that? How long after you take the pins out? Do you have to kind of wait? The biggest thing for us is whenever you're putting hardware in or taking hardware out, it's a matter of letting the wounds heal. Otherwise, you increase your risk of infection. If you let them go back too early and be aggressive with it, the incisions are not healed, then they start sweating on the incision and all that kind of stuff. That can be a big problem. That kind of window period for, you know, letting things kind of heal up, at least from an incision, incisional perspective, is usually about two or three weeks. Mm. Um, you're kind of pushing your luck a little bit if you go earlier than that. So those would be some of the options they'd have to weigh. But, of course, along that process is the matter of letting the bone heal, giving that plenty of time to do what it needs to do, which is going to be a good kind of four to six weeks, leaning more towards six weeks. And you start talking about having to take the pins out and healing up from those. Now you might put yourself down the road eight to ten weeks, which makes it pretty tight terms of playoffs and that kind of stuff for him. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us in Nebraska Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. Some more clarity here on Bryce Harper. Pins uh, inserted into that thumb. When it gets down to it, what is that that overwhelming or overriding decision to say, okay, let's put pins in the thumb? When do you guys decide to, to go forward? That's the best way to stabilize and heal versus uh, an alternative winter pins necessary. Yeah, you know the big a couple of reasons. The big things are is 
typically if you're going to have a fracture that's near what we call like a joint surface or articular surface, um, and that basically would be where your smooth kind of joint is, you have a smooth surface that it articulates with. If you have a fracture that goes into that area and a piece of that kind of moves or shifts away from where it's supposed to be, now you're talking about having an incongruent joint. That would be simply you want to you know, get back in the perfect alignment or close to it and have a couple of pins to secure that. Um, traditionally, those are kind of smaller fragmented type pieces, so it's hard to kind of hold that in place with just a cast. So that'd be a time when you'd want to use pins, and that's probably the scenario he's dealing with here would be my guess. This probably uh, transitioned into his one to one of his joints in the thumb. Uh, other times you use it is just if you have what we call like an unstable fracture, and so any a fracture along the length of that bone that as you try to push on it, hold it in place in the cast, it just kind of keeps slipping out of place, then you have to put pins stabilize that, hold it in preliminarily until the bone come, forms a bridge across there and then becomes stable from that. Those would be kind of the two biggest times you'd want to use pins or any type of internal fixation. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Bryce Harper, our topic, a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, and uh, Bryce Harper with uh, the pins in the thumb. And that is, uh, you look at, at, at pins and you know what's the um, what's the typical success rate? You, you laid out perfectly the the precaution of of trying to rehab or or move too quickly uh, to get back on the field for Harper. But uh, I'm interested here with uh, just knowing. Okay, you have pins put in. Great. Uh, the success story of doing so. What's what's the the full recovery rate look like? You bet, Chris. So, from a you know, success standpoint, then this this will work very well for him. Um, they'll they'll they would obtain some really good healing. Um, obviously, the, the one part that would impact that some would be how much of that kind of joint surface is involved. If there's a bunch of little small little pieces there, then that equates to more kind of you know discomfort down the road, uh, more kind of arthritis down the road. If it's kind of one main piece, this will heal well. He'll do well. When you look at it from like a timing perspective, again, you're kind of looking at that. You know probably six week time frame really let that bone become solid. Then you go from there, we didn't mention this before, now you start talking about doing a rehab program. You know, when can you really start that? Um, obviously you can't really start that rehab program until you have made you have developed a good stability within the bone. And then that rehab process can be you know, anywhere from three, four, five weeks of you know pretty intense rehab with the hand to regain that motion. Once that bone is basically solid enough, you know, from a healing perspective you know, even if that, that patient hasn't totally went all the way through their rehab program from a baseball perspective, you could consider maybe throwing him in the alignment uh, in the lineup as a DH and just hitting with this as opposed to being in the field, and that might be reasonable. Again, he's taking a, a fastball off the you know, handle on that bat, and that's not going to feel very good and be tough for him. Um, and you even run the risk of obviously taking one off the handle. You could re-break this early in that kind of recovery phase. So it'll be a delicate um, and difficult kind of recovery. And once he kind of gets past that, I would say kind of week seven, eight, how aggressive you be with him, that'll be where those decisions really will be kind of tough for him. Dr. Brandon, a thought with the, um, the, the thumb here in the rehab. Is it a feel thing? for him and just how well rehab's going or are you constantly either MRI or X-raying also as a follow-up to get a to get a good look? Yeah, you know, the imaging piece is really important. Um, and it mainly would be with X-rays. Uh, this should be an area that should be, you know, readily be visible with X-rays. And so that would be how they follow it. Um, you know, it, when these folks are at that level, are thinking about trying to go back and you're thinking about an early return for them, which that's always the big question mark, he'll probably end up getting, I would assume, kind of weekly imaging, weekly x-rays on this as they're getting down to that point where he's kind of week to week on the return to play. I would assume that's what they'll probably do with him to follow that progress. And then the feel part definitely comes into play as well. Um, you know, how, how, how much confidence does he have in that thumb? How much strength does he have? Does he feel like he has that power? And is you know, the pain manageable when he is making contact with the bat? Dr. Brandon, thank you so much for the update and the insight on Bryce Harper. Three pins in that injured thumb as uh, he tries and says he'll be back before the season's done to, to try and help the Phils 
play, make a playoff push. Dr. Brandon, have a great week. Thanks for your time. You bet, Chris. You guys take care. Like what you hear, high-quality radio and podcast is part of what we do at Hale Varsity. Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with Hale Varsity Radio, and I wanted to offer listeners of the Hale Varsity Radio Show podcast $10 off the price of an annual subscription. That means that you can get everything we do, 10 issues of our monthly magazine, our annual football yearbook, and all the premium content we produce at HaleVarsity.com. Just go to HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe and enter in the promo code GBR for $10 off a full year of Hail Varsity. That's HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe promo code GBR. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring me in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time, so interesting what we get from our incredible listeners via email. Our old boy uh, Kevin said an email, and uh, one of my favorite coaches ever, Barry Switzer, is doing a selfie with uh, Kevin and uh, his, uh, his brother. They're having dinner, and... Uh, Kevin's like, you know, I think there might be a Spartan down there having dinner with with Barry. That'd be uh, that'd be one Malachi Coleman. You uh, many have tried and few have <laughs> um, turned down the charm of one Barry Switzer when it comes to recruiting. Yeah, I mean that's Oklahoma pulling out the big guns. That's that's They're the that's, biggest of guns. That is. I mean that's that's the bootleggers boy right there, and. Um, I don't know that Malachi has been down in Oklahoma. I know he's been to Oklahoma multiple times, and it's Michigan, it's Oklahoma, it's Nebraska. But, I mean, Mickey Joseph has been incredible. Mickey Joseph has one more, several options, but one more monster in-state target. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Barry's so, so good at spreading the Sooner love. That that's uh, that's that's impressive. Big thanks to Kevin for the email. Yeah, and if if Kevin proves me right here, if Malachi's off to Oklahoma, from, uh, well, I'm, from, I, I'm just saying from this day forward or from that day forward, Kevin would be sooner insider Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that he'll like you calling him a sooner insider. <laughs> hey, he earned the, it. Them's fighting words <laughs> for for a lot of Nebraska fans. So that's the word there. So you can't always uh, choose your titles. Can't always choose your No, friends. but that's Barry being Barry. Mm-hmm. He's out of the famous restaurant in Norman, and, you know, I, I don't have Malachi's schedule. Uh, I know that it's later in the season <clears throat> that he wants to uh, commit, but it is going to be a dogfight, man, for, for Nebraska. It's going to be a dogfight for Michigan, for Oklahoma. You want to talk about salt in the wound? Your top prospect in state for 2023 doesn't go to Nebraska. And and he doesn't go to Nebraska because he picks Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, man. You already lost uh, McIntyre, mm-hmm. uh, Fremont Bergen linebacker. And so, last year you lost uh, the tight end. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bellevue West. Yeah, Riley. Was it Riley, du- Riley Ducker? Is that it? Yep, yeah, I think so. I, I think I got the name right there. So the reality is this, and, and Mickey's a, a good relationship developer. Mickey's a good relationship uh, extender. That's if he's already had a relationship with you, uh, like he did with, with Miller from his LSU, from his you know junior high days. Should make a correction here. Mike O'Reilly Ducker off to Auburn. Well, there's another yeah, who's tight end. Who, who am I forgetting here? Is it Riley? There's just a Riley. I'm pretty sure. I'm frantically Googling. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you're, you're typing and typing and typing away. Reminder to get buckled in as seatbelts save lives. One of every three fatal crashes in Nebraska involves an alcohol-impaired driver. Why take the chance? If you drink, don't drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office tomorrow. Phil Steele, college football preview on the Big Red. We'll check in with Coach Barnett as well. A Huda Media Production.